winter wonderland, amazing. Oh yeah, so I'm Jed, I'm part of the care team here. And hey, if you're a guest here, we're so glad that you're here. As you're coming in, uh, you may have saw the information center out there. Make sure you stop by there on your way out and grab a, a gift. We have a gift for you. We would love to get to know you. Hey, if you're online and you are making some eggs and bacon, it smells so good up here, so thankful for you. Glad you're watching online. And uh, hey, being in the care ministry, just wanna say thank you for those of you filling out prayer requests. We love to see those and get to pray over those and walk alongside of you. For those of you filling out get support forms, we know that, that uh, life is difficult sometimes and we need each other here. And so just don't hesitate. Fill out a get support form. We love to come alongside of you. And in care ministry, we have a trauma healing event coming up here. This Thursday, 6 to 8, these events have been incredibly healing. We'd love to invite all of you out. Everyone's welcome. We're going to be talking about how we use our feelings for good. There's a lot going on, especially as we enter into Holy Week here. And we'd love for you to come out this Thursday, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Hey, ladies, uh, we have an amazing opportunity for you coming up. For you to hear from inspiring speakers, to be connected to other women, to have a one-day conference. So the IF Gathering is a national conference that was held in February. We get to have access to it for one day. We're putting on a one-day event. And we would love for you to invite all your friends to come on out to this IF Conference. You need to sign up by Easter. So this next Sunday, it is on the following Saturday, April 6th. So make sure uh, you get on that and invite a friend to come to that. It'll be great. As we enter into this week, we have Good Friday services, 5.30 and 7 p.m. 5.30 service, we have child care. So make sure if you need some child care, come to the 5.30. Uh, we also will have a 7 service. And then on Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we have three services, Easter services. Uh, this place is gonna be full because you are gonna invite your friends, and fill this place with your family. And so in light of that, we have three services, 8, 9.30, and 11. The 9.30 and 11 have our kids' ministry programming. The 8 o'clock will not. But also make sure as you come in next Sunday, fill the middle, right? Fill it on in. And we know that parking is going to be an issue. And so make sure if you are going south, leaving south, uh, maybe even today, check it out. Check out this, this route. It's a, there's, a, there's a map, I believe and uh, go toward Brentwood and out toward Hoover that way. Uh, so maybe check out that way. That'll help with the congestion. Hey, it's going to be an amazing morning of worshiping our King Jesus as we kick off Holy Week. So if you could stand, we're going to sing praise to our King.
for being the same God who entered Jerusalem triumphantly so many years ago that is now sitting on the throne in heaven right now. I pray, Lord, that we would all be able to lay our lives down in service to you and adoration to you as your disciples and your followers laid palm branches and cloaks down before you as you entered your holy city, Jesus. May we always remember that no matter what changes, you remain the same. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. God, where are you? It's a question that's been asked throughout time. See, it started with a garden. God made the earth, and he made a place for humans, a place where he could be with humans. And so he was there with humans, and they decided, Adam and Eve, to go their own way, to sin, to do evil, and to reject God. And so he looked at humans in the garden, and there was a problem. See, he had made humans good, but now they weren't. But they could live forever. And so God sent them out of the garden. He said, how bad would it be if these humans who are no longer good, who are capable of such evil, would then live forever in that? So he sent them out of the garden, and the cry began, God, where are you? But it didn't end there. Eventually, God came to Abraham, and he told Abraham, through your family, I am going to bless the entire world. See, God had a plan to go back to the garden, to go back to where God and humans could be with each other. And it was through Abraham's family. So God made a covenant, a promise, a relationship that said, I'm going to do something, Abraham, through your family to bring God and people back together. But if you know the story of Abraham's family, they fell apart pretty quickly. So a few generations later, the Israelites, as they became known, were down in Egypt and they were slaves. And again, the cry, God, where are you? So God came in a burning bush to an old man who is on the run for murder, Moses. And he said, Moses, you are going to go, and through my power, you are going to set the Israelites free. You're going to rescue my people, and you're going to bring them to a mountain. And again, I'm going to be with my people. And so he did that. God rescued the Israelites. He saved them. Brought them to a mountain, and he made a covenant. Again, a relationship agreement where he said, I will be your God. You will be my people. I'll be with you. And so God traveled with them to the land of Israel that he gave them. And they built a temple. And if you can imagine, the temple was the place where heaven and earth met. It was where God and people could be together. But as time went on, over hundreds of years, humans did, again, what they seemed to always do. So they decided to live evil lives and to reject God, to turn away. And for hundreds of years, God sent prophets, he sent blessings, he sent discipline, all of it to call his people back to him. But they wouldn't. So finally, God sent Ezekiel, a prophet. And Ezekiel saw a vision. He looked out and he saw the Spirit of God hovering above Israel. And he was taken to the temple. He looked in the temple and he saw evil. He saw idols. He saw people hurting other people. And then he watched as the Spirit of God left the temple. Shortly after, armies came and destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple and they sent everyone off to exile, dragged them to different cities. Again, the cry, God, where are you? While they were in exile, a day came where Cyrus, the king of Persia, sent the Israelites back to their homeland to rebuild the temple. Under Nehemiah, they rebuilt the wall. The Greeks came, conquered their city, but through the Maccabeans, they actually overthrew the Greeks and took over Jerusalem again. And so Jacob Maccabeus rode into Israel, rode into Jerusalem, the holy city, as their leader, and they were free. And they thought, this is how it should be. Israel run again under God's power. Shortly after, about 100 years, in came Rome. And the Israelites had never seen anything like Rome. The Romans came in and destroyed the Israelites almost effortlessly, set up rule. Any Israelite that threatened Rome, threatened their government, threatened stability, taxes, any of that, they hung on a cross, killed for everyone to see. 
So you have the Israelites living in their home, but not ruling themselves, not ruled by God. And again, the cry, God, where are you? This is Holy Week, the beginning of Holy Week. It's Palm Sunday. And today is the day that we begin looking at the greatest achievement that's ever happened in human history, which is Jesus who came, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, died for our sins, and rose from the dead. He defeated death for us. My name's Justin. I'm a pastor here on staff. I work with students, and it's my joy today to get to walk through um, what we sometimes call the triumphal entry. It's Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Um, it's in all four Gospels, um, but we're going to be in Matthew. So if you want, you can open up your Bible to Matthew 21, and we're going to discuss um, what happens before Jesus goes to the cross. My hope today is to bring you into the story and to prepare you for what's coming this week as we celebrate what Jesus has done. So if you have your Bibles, you can see uh, Matthew 21. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen if you want to join there. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. All right, we start the story off. Um, pretty cool. So there's these people traveling. Uh, what just happened is there's been some healings. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. He's been anointed at Bethany, which is a symbol of his coming, uh, being king. And they're getting ready to get to Jerusalem, but there's a town before they get to Jerusalem. Imagine them on a road trip as they pilgrim to Jerusalem. And Jesus has kind of a strange request for his disciples. He says, go to the village ahead and bring back a donkey and a colt. You're going to find them. They're just tied up in the town and if anybody asks, just say, the Lord needs them, and you'll be fine. Don't forget how weird following Jesus can be. <laughs> like, I try to imagine, like, we go on mission trips with students every summer, and I try to imagine what would happen if we went on a mission trip, you know, and we're somewhere, I don't know, rural South Dakota. We're going to go do a service project, tell people about Jesus, and I grab a couple middle schoolers. Hey, guys, um, go to the next town, bike there, I don't know, whatever, walk there, something. There's going to be two donkeys just tied up. Bring them here. <laughs> Somebody like comes out of the house and they're angry or they're confused, just be like, Woodlands needs them, don't worry, and then bring them. If you've been around middle schoolers, you'd be like, yeah, that's exactly what they would do. They would be riding them towards you. They'd probably be playing some game, doing something wild. It'd be fun. Right, but, but following Jesus is kind of strange sometimes. So here's Jesus. They're on their way to Jerusalem, and he asks his disciples, go get this donkey and this colt. So I've always wondered, maybe you've wondered this question, where did they come from? Like, did they, like, a portal open and God just, like, miraculously created a colt and a donkey in a town? And it was, like, boom, there for the disciples to just have. Or is it maybe more, like, dark or morbid? Like, did somebody die or forget and it's these, like, this donkey and colt that no one now owns and they just wander in, like, perfect timing? Or sometimes I wonder, I, mean, I think back to even last week when John, or Dave talked about Ananias if you remember, Saul ends up being told, go to this town and someone named Ananias is going to come to you. And then it like jumps over to Ananias's perspective. And an angel comes to Ananias and say, hey, there's this guy, Saul, go talk to him. I always wonder, like, is there a part of the story that we just don't get to see, right? Like the authors only put so many things in here. Otherwise, the book would be way too big. So I always wonder, was there someone in Bethphage who an angel came to and was like, hey, that donkey and that colt that you have, go tie them up, leave them in the city. It's going to be fine. The Lord needs them. So maybe when they came in, there was someone waiting, excited, ready to see what was going to happen. I think about that with generosity, how God asks us to give him the things that he's given us. And sometimes we can think generosity or giving back to God is him like taking things from us, when instead it's this place where God actually invites us into something he's doing. How cool would it be if you were a person who got to give that donkey and colt to Jesus as he rode in, like, that's my donkey, <laughs> Like, he's, he's writing because I, I did, he told me to do that, and I did it. So he's writing. Like, how cool would that be? I think that's a picture of what God asks from us continually. He's not saying, like, hey, you have all this stuff, and I want to take it from you because I'm really mean and I'm angry or you got too much. He's saying, hey, I give you really good gifts, and what you get to do is you actually get to be a part of what I'm doing in the world. You get to be a part of the story of, that I'm telling throughout time. It's exciting to be a follower of Jesus, to take part in those stories. So he sends these disciples on what seems like a bizarre mission. Then verse four, 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay, there's this prophecy. Now, um, when we think of prophecy, um, I always like to explain it a little bit, because in my mind, I remember growing up especially, in my mind, prophecy was kind of like, oh, somebody a long time ago said something, and then someone else a long time later, like, happens to do the thing they said, and it's like, oh, cool, like, it fulfilled it. Uh, maybe you've seen Dune 2. I haven't actually watched it, but I know the story well enough to know, right? Paul Atreides, he's fulfilling these prophecies. And people are looking and like, oh, he must be the Messiah. He's fulfilling prophecy. That is not what's happening in this story. Not exactly. It isn't like someone a long time ago, Zechariah, was like, hey, God told me in a vision this is gonna happen. And then Jesus comes along and is like, oh, look, donkeys. Like, I happen to be doing everything God's saying. Coincidence. It'd be more like this. Let me give you a better example to think of prophecy. Imagine we're out there and we're like talking in the foyer and you're like, hey, Justin, let's go get coffee. And I say, great, 9 a.m., let's meet at Ruby's tomorrow. So tomorrow you get up, you like to be places early, you get there at 8.30 and you're watching the door. You're drinking your maple latte. 8.35, 8.45, 8.55, 8.57, 8.59, 9:00. 9 o'clock, the door opens and I walk in. Now, are you sitting there and going, Oh my goodness, Justin can tell the future. This is incredible. Let's go buy lottery tickets. Right? No, you would probably be like, oh my goodness, Justin's on time. <laughs> Look, mark it on the calendar. This is a holiday. Right? What you would think is, I said I was going to do something and I did it. That is what prophecy is. Prophecy is God, years, decades, centuries ago, saying, I'm going to do something. And then God doing what he said he's going to do. That's why Jesus said, uh, let your yes be yes and your no be no. It's a command of Jesus to do what we say we're gonna do. It's a reminder for me. It's something I struggle with. God was being God. He was being faithful. So prophecy wasn't this like, oh, he just happened to fulfill some random criteria. It was God doing what he said he was gonna do. But there's something else with this specific prophecy. Um, I wanna take you to a text that you might not be familiar with. It's called the Talmud. So this is Jewish writing, and um, Israelites, rabbis, they'd write a little bit differently than we would. I actually kind of like it sometimes, um, because what they would do is they would come forward. I'll show you an example. Um, here's one. So Rabbi Alexandri says, you can read on the screen, he says this, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi raises a contradiction between two depictions of the coming Messiah. So this Rabbi, Yehoshua ben Levi, he comes to people or to Alexandri, and he says, there's a problem. There's two verses in the Bible, and one's saying one thing, one's saying something else, and they don't agree with each other. You ever read that, thought that? Yep, so he comes that way and he has, we have a problem here. So what are the verses? So then they explain the verses. It says, it is written, there came with the clouds of heaven one like unto a son of man, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. So that's Daniel. And it's written, behold, your king will come to you. He is just and victorious, lowly and riding upon a donkey and upon a colt the foal of a donkey. That's Zechariah. So this maybe young rabbi comes forward and he said, there's these two passages and one of them says God's gonna come with glory on the clouds and majesty. And one says that he's gonna come lowly riding upon a donkey into the city. That doesn't make any sense. Those, those both can't happen at the same time. So what do we do? So the wise rabbi then answers the question. So this is what Rabbi Alexander explains. If the Jewish people merit redemption, the Messiah will come in a miraculous manner with the clouds of heaven. If they do not merit redemption, the Messiah will come lowly and riding upon a donkey. So they have these two passages that are about the coming Messiah, and they're trying to figure out how can they both be true when they're so different. And this wise rabbi says, well, it depends on the people of Israel. Now, you can take these Jewish rabbis' musings combined with what's about to happen and maybe think what you want, but the reason I share that is actually to help us see that when Israelites saw this passage, when they saw this moment in time, they knew what it meant. They knew that it was God having promised long ago to send a Messiah, and this is going to be what it looked like, part of what it looked like. So Jesus is not just fulfilling some random prophecy. Right? It's not like, oh, somebody rode a donkey and a colt. Cool. Like, I'll just do that random thing from the Old Testament. There were people asking the question, God, where are you? And they knew that one day he would come on a donkey and a colt. And so Jesus does what he said he was going to do. Verse 6. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So he goes and he rides in on a donkey and a colt. And people respond. Now, we probably miss a lot of what's happening in this response. There are things going on in this passage that just, they don't make sense with what we're used to. So I want to explain a couple of them to you. So the first is cloaks. Um, when you think of somebody throwing a cloak down, um, I think of like old movies where there's like a woman in a dress and it's kind of like drizzling outside and there's a big puddle on a sidewalk and like the chivalrous man walks up with like a big overcoat and is like, here, let me help you. And like throws the cloak down and the woman can like walk over the puddle. It's kind of what I think of. And there's an, a bit of that that's true to what's happening. Uh, but what they're thinking of is a story in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 9.13, where there's a man, Jehu, and he got kind of pulled away from his friends and this prophet comes, anoints him with oil and says, you are going to be the king of Israel. So he goes back and his friends and people he knows are asking him, like, what did that prophet grab you for? What's happening? And he said, I'm going to be king. And so they throw down their cloaks in front of him. This was a sign of royalty coming into a city, specifically the king. So they're throwing down their cloaks. And these cloaks were not like your extra winter jacket that you use to go sledding so that if it gets really muddy, it's fine. Like, wash it and you'll be okay. Um, in this world, their, their cloak was their blanket, it was their safety, it kept them warm. There were laws about what you could and couldn't do and when you couldn't take their cloak, which is why kind of Jesus' line of like, if they take your cloak, give them your shirt, how ridiculous that would be. You didn't take an Israelite's cloak. And yet here they are giving it up freely, participating in what God is doing here. So the cloaks on the ground, and then you have these palm branches being waved. Um, you might not know this story super well. It's not in my tradition either, so I don't know it super well normally. Um, but Jacob Maccabeus, when the Greeks ruled Jerusalem and they overthrew the Greeks before the Romans came, when Jacob Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem, that's what they did is they grabbed palm branches to wave in this coming ruler. So again, we have these things happening where people are saying, here's this king, this Messiah coming into Jerusalem. And then they're calling out, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, son of David is maybe like the clearest you can get from an Israelite about who they expected Jesus to be as a king. The son of David meant this promised um, descendant of the line of David that would come back and rule. So they're calling out Hosanna to the son of David. So what does this word Hosanna mean? We're going to jump into it. Um, Nate Sankey grabbed me after first service and reminded me, you're all coming back from spring break, students. So apologies. We're going to jump into some Greek and Hebrew and some Latin. So this is second service. You had time to get up and do it. You're fine, right? Like first service, they were kind of out of it, but you'll be okay. Okay. So throw Hosanna up there. Uh, we have the Greek Hosanna. So that W um, with a little line, that's going to be your ho Santa. The Vs are Ns. I know it's weird. So it's Greek. They're yelling out Greek Hosanna. Um, it comes from Hebrew, Hoshiana. Now Hebrew is read backwards. So you want to start with that it kind of looks like an H, I guess. I don't even know how to describe Hebrew letters. I'm realizing it kind of looks like a backwards R or something. Anyway, um, it goes backwards. Uh, that bracket X is the word na. So there, it's a Greek version of a Hebrew word, hoshiana. So what's hoshiana? Well, hoshiana is a verb form of the verb yasha. So free Hebrew lesson this morning, which I know you were all waiting for, right? That's why you got up this morning. Uh, Hebrew, how it works is there's these like three letter roots, it's three consonants, and it means something. And then what they would do is they would kind of like change those three consonants to make it mean different things. Um, and so they would add and subtract things and they would modify it to get a meaning across. So the basic meaning of yasha is to save. But this is a different form of that word. Let me give you an example of how this form works. If I wanted you to cause me to remember something, I would use the word remind. Right, we don't think about it often, but when I say, hey, remind me to be at Ruby's nine o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, I, I would use the word remind, but what I mean is cause me to remember. Don't let me forget. Make me remember by telling me. It's the causative form of a verb. In Hebrew, it would be the same root word, yasha. So what this word is saying is cause us to be saved. 
God, cause our salvation, please. That's what that na means, please. Please cause our salvation. They're crying this out. It's echoing back to when the Israelites needed saving in Egypt. God, cause our salvation. Okay, so what does that have to do with this story? Let's keep reading. Verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Okay, in case you thought the language lessons were over, we're going to continue just a little more, I promise. It'll be fun. It might ruin some of your days. I hope it doesn't. Students, you're aware of some of this. Uh, so we're going to get into Jesus' name. If you want to put that up there. We're used to calling him Jesus. That's the name we use for him. Unfortunately, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news today on Palm Sunday, but his name was actually Joshua. He didn't know that. Jesus' name was Joshua. Uh, but we get here in kind of a weird way. So the first one is Latin, Jesus, and below that is the Greek, Jesus. So what happened was um, they would call him Jesus because that's how you translate Joshua into Greek. And as time went on, they did Latin. And as time continued to go on through the Middle Ages, nobody spoke Latin, just like today. <laughs> no one spoke Latin, but they would still do services where they would cry out to Jesus and call it to Jesus and pray to Jesus in Latin. So you have all of these Christians throughout the world who love Jesus, who are following God, and they're calling out to Yesu. Well, then they decide to translate the Bible into English. Now this is where it gets tricky. They're translating from the Greek and the Hebrew. So they start translating and they realize, oh, if we translate Jesus' name from the original language, then we get Joshua. How weird would you think I am if I came up here and said, all right, Let's pray, and I get done, and I say, in Joshua's name, amen. Some of you be like, I'm finding another church. <laughs> like, it's time. Right? Or we're going to be singing, um, I speak Jesus this morning, uh, after we're done. What if the band came up and the lyrics were different and they started singing, I speak Joshua. I just want to speak the name of Joshua over everything. You'd be like, Woodlands, eh, what is going on? Like, I need to email someone or talk to somebody, right? Because when you say the name Joshua and you see the name Jesus, you connect it to people. And it was the same for people that were talking about Jesus in Latin. So we get this really strange thing where the name Joshua ends up getting translated especially just for Jesus as Jesus, which is fine. It's like Jesus gets his own name because of how important he is, which is really cool. But what that means is we miss the meaning of his name because his name, Joshua, is the word Yehoshua, which is the same as Joshua, son of Nun in the Old Testament, but it got shortened throughout time until it was Yeshua, so Jesus' name, maybe I think in The Chosen they use that name, correct? maybe you're familiar with that, um, is Yeshua. It was a Hebrew name. Now, um, Yeshua is actually a word used in the Old Testament. So if you want to bring up Exodus, in Exodus 15 two, the, um, this is right after they're saved. This is part of Moses' song. It says, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my Yeshua. It gets translated salvation. Because that's what Jesus' name means. It's from that same root, yasha. It means salvation. So here we have Jesus anointed at Bethany to be king. He goes, he gets his donkey and his colt, just like God said he would. He's riding in, they're putting down cloaks like they would for a king. They're waving palm branches like they did for Jacob Maccabeus when he entered to rule over Jerusalem. They're yelling out to the son of David, and they're saying, God, cause our salvation. Cause our salvation. And then people start to ask, well, who's that? Oh, that's, that's salvation. Riding in on a donkey. Could God be any more clear? I'll admit, I sometimes get frustrated when I hear people say, God, like Jesus never claimed to be God. The Bible never tries to tell you that he was God. Frankly, they don't know how to read complex literature, which the Bible is. They couldn't be more clear about what is happening over and over and over again, that Jesus is doing something so specific here. But it doesn't actually stop there. Go to verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those, who, uh, of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. A den of robbers. Okay, here he comes into the temple. I've talked before, I won't rehash it, that maybe this scene isn't as violent or aggressive as we picture, right? Like, I think a lot of people picture losing at Monopoly and so you like flip the table out of anger. I don't think that's what's happening. 
Again, if you don't remember, um, the word used for overturned is the word like closing a restaurant, shutting something down. They didn't have fancy neon, like cool neon open close signs that they could turn on and off. And so they would turn over the table they're using to signify it's closed. If you've ever been at a restaurant when you shouldn't be at like 9.58 and they close at 10 and they're trying to like subtly tell you, please don't order anything. We've, we've shut everything down in the kitchen. And you might see all the chairs turned upside down on tables. That's probably similarly to what it's talking about. So Jesus comes in and he shuts down the temple. And he quotes this verse from Jeremiah. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, when I hear that, I kind of think instinctively, oh, right, like he's shutting down a booth where they sell stuff and it's a den of robbers and robbers steal things. And so what's happening is people are coming to the temple, but they're getting stolen from. And Jesus is angry about that. So he's shutting it down because they're stealing which can kind of make sense, and maybe that was happening, but I don't think that's what Jesus was doing. Here's two reasons why. The first is that um, the passage it's referencing is Jeremiah 7. If you go read Jeremiah, what ends up happening is um, God comes to the Israelites in that same time period I talked about with Ezekiel, where the people weren't following God. And he, um, God starts speaking to the Israelites, and he says this. He says, you are all, every day of the year, you're living out in the world in evil ways. You're killing, you're committing adultery, you're stealing. You have slaves that you're abusing. Like you are living evil lives. And this isn't like, oh, I'm doing my best and I keep messing up and I'm trying to follow God. This was people who didn't care about God. They were worshiping idols. He says, you do that every day of the year and then you come to the temple and it has this line that says, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. God's saying, you all the rest of the year, do whatever you want, live evil, and then you come to the temple and you think that's going to save you. It won't. So God was saying to them in Jeremiah. That's what Jesus quotes. Maybe he's making a connection about how the Israelites were living and what they were coming to do at the temple. But also even just that phrase, den of robbers. It kind of becomes obvious once you think about it. A den of robbers isn't where they go to rob. Um, another way to say this is a den of criminals or a den of thieves. Um, if you've played the game Skyrim, I know it's a video game I'm referencing on stage, wild, right? If you play the game Skyrim, there's the Thieves Guild. It's this place in a game where you go and all of the thieves, all the bad people in the city hang out. But here's the thing, they don't do criminal activity there. That's where the criminals run after doing their criminal activity. That's what a thieves hideout is. That's what Jesus is referencing. He's referencing a place in the world where criminals would run to to be safe from the law. And God says, you've made my temple where heaven and earth meet. You've made that a place where criminals go and gather and think they're gonna be safe. Like you can just go do anything you want throughout the week and then come here like it's fine because you say my name. So he comes to the temple, he shuts it down and maybe he starts to illuminate what's going on there. And then he does something else. Verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. So he comes in, shuts down the temple and he stands in its place. To all the people who'd been crying out, God, where are you? Jesus stands loudly through everything he is doing and he says, I am right here. See, people had been going to the temple to be saved and the temple hadn't been where God was since it was destroyed hundreds of years ago. But people still went there to an empty temple. And then Jesus comes and he stands and he says, you think this temple can save you? You think sacrificing these animals can save you? They can't. Only I can. Church, as we head into Holy Week, as we think about the sacrifices in the temple and ultimately the sacrifice that Jesus made, let us remember, there is nothing else that can save us. There's nothing else we can go to. There's no one else we can run to other than Jesus. As I think about this story and I think about the time that it is, I think about the crowds gathered in the city. 
And it's interesting because with this story, you actually get kind of some cool things happening. You have people who know Jesus, who love Jesus, who are following Jesus, and they're following him, they're with him. And then you have crowds of people who are gathered around and they're excited about who Jesus is. They don't really understand it all, but they're, they're in for the ride. But then you have the city, the city of people who they see something happening and they ask like, what's going on? Who is that? I'm intrigued. And today's Palm Sunday. Traditionally, it's a Sunday where most of you here probably follow Jesus. Next week is gonna be Good Friday and Easter. Traditionally, that's a week where people come who don't know who Jesus is. I think this is a cool opportunity, just like the people who are following Jesus, who got asked the question, who is this? And who were then able to answer, it's Jesus. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you the story of how him and I met. Let me tell you some stories about things that he's done. Church, we have that same opportunity this week. People you know, hopefully, maybe you'll see someone here who you've never seen here before, and you can say hi to them. Ask them who they are. And if they ask you a question of, what do you do here? Like, what's this place about? Who is this Jesus? That you can be ready to answer. And for our own lives, as we get ready for Good Friday and Easter, I think of that cry that the Israelites had, God, save us. I wonder, maybe you could spend this week asking the question, what do you need, need saved from right now? What in your life, whether it's an addiction, a sin, a problem, a sickness, uh, I don't know. What in your life do you need God to save you from? And then a second question. What does God want to turn over in your life? See, people were going to the temple, offering sacrifices, thinking it could save them, and it couldn't. And we do the same thing in our lives. We go somewhere to something thinking that it will help us, and it doesn't. So maybe another question to reflect on as we get closer to Easter is God, what in my life do you want to turn over? What do you want to rearrange in my life? What do you want to shut down or close so that instead of going to it, I go to you? Maybe spend some time this week asking God those two questions. God, what do I need to be saved from that maybe I don't even know? And God, what do you want to shut down in my life? What do you want to stop in my life so that I can see you more clearly, so that I can come to you and be healed? So church, this week, as we think about maybe a world that I think cries, God, where are you? Let us be ready both in our own lives and hearts and in our mouth as we speak to answer, where is God? He is here with us. He is Jesus. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being a God that fulfills his promises. God, I think we often take for granted that when you say you're gonna do something, you do it. And we worship you for that, for your faithfulness. God, this week, as we think about these questions, as we ask, what do we need saved from? God, I don't know, sometimes there's things in my life that I don't even recognize that I need saved from. But you are the one who saves. So help us to see that. Help us to ask you for help. And God, examine our lives. Help us to find something to see something that you want to shut down, that you want to close so that we can come to you. And God, give us the courage to do that because God, we want to know you more and to be with you because we love you. Amen.
you may be seated. to ask you, I'm just wondering if you would invite my friends or my neighbors to come to church for me. You want me to invite your friends and neighbors to church? Yep. For, for you? Yep. <laughs> I guess I could, but I have an idea, Keely. Why don't you invite them yourself? Invite them myself? Yeah. You want me to invite them myself? No! Get a hold of yourself. What is going on? Dave, I have a few reasons why I can't invite my friends to church. A few reasons why you can't invite your friends and neighbors to church? Yes, I have a few reasons why I can't invite my friends to church. The first reason that I can't invite my friends is that I'm afraid I might get made fun of. What are you, church? Yeah. I don't want to go to church. What are you, one of those Jesus freaks, those freaky Jesus people? Oh, this girl have an egg. I mean, this is ridiculous. Here, have a roll of toilet paper. This is crazy. I don't want to go to church. The second reason is that, if I'm being honest, I don't think I've always been a very good neighbor. Hey, so you got to go over there, and you need to poop over there on the neighbor's lawn. Okay, you ready? Okay, okay, go. No, go. No, you got, oh, cat. Uh, hey, hey, neighbor. Hey, you wanna come to church on Easter Sunday? The third reason, Dave, is that I'm afraid I won't know what to say. Oh, uh, hey, neighbor. Oh, hi, you old your neighbor. That's, that's great. Hey, I, I wanted to invite you to church for Easter Sunday. Church? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to go to church. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just one question. How does your church believe the pre super lopsarian intention of our creative God interfaces with the teleological and eschatological process of soteriology, especially as that interfaces with the ecumenical church? Dave, the fourth reason is that John might say something weird. Before we get into next week, we need to talk about last week. If you are here last week, something happened toward the end of the service that has made some ripples. Uh, was doing an illustration on what it means to build up the body of Christ. My sons are into Legos. This is not one of my sons. This is actually, I got this out of Stevie's office. <laughs> it's cute. And then uh, we talked about what it meant to tear down the body of Christ. And that Lego creation started to go away, right? And then it got thrown onto the floor and it crashed. And there was an audible gasp in the room. I... <laughs> well, Keely, those are pretty serious reasons. But if we're honest, they're probably more like excuses, right? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, here's my friend Hiroko, who can share her story of how she invited a friend to church and how that went. Hiroko. Yeah, so I had this friend at one point that I thought, I felt like she could be benefited from coming to Woodlands Church. And so I invited her and um, I just shared a little bit about why I love Woodlands Church. You know, like the um, preaching of the gospel and I'm always taught by pastors and and I love how people are so friendly and welcoming and uh, the best thing is that every time when I leave church I feel so energized and filled so I was sharing all these things with her did she make fun of you no she did not throw anything at me she did not make fun of me so I was safe and uh, she was even intrigued and very excited to hear but she said no, <laughs> she said, no, thank you. Yeah. So I was disappointed, but 
But the cool thing is that she came back. She came back like a few months later. Yeah, yeah. And she's still coming back. She's a regular attendant and she's serving on Sundays. That's amazing. So that, you know, the point is that, you know, they might say yes, they might say no, but you know, we don't know how God's gonna use it. So we just be obedient, right? And invite. Yeah. Hey guys, we know that sometimes it's scary to invite your friends to church, but Easter is an opportunity for you to invite your friends, neighbors, and family. And we wanna help you do that. We have invite cards as you leave this morning. You can pick one of these up and hand them out to your friends and neighbors. This season, let's invite our friends and families to join us to celebrate Easter together. That's right, grab an invite card on your way out and make sure you invite your family and friends and fill this place up. We wanna speak Jesus, amen? Everywhere we go. And so I have a, a passage I wanna read you in light of that. Luke 19, 37 through 40. As he was drawing near, already on the way to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God uh, with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who has come in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Church, let's cry out. Let's speak Jesus. Let's not wait for the stones to cry out. And make sure you go out into our neighborhood as sent followers of Jesus. Hey, we love you. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. God bless.